All righty. So we are going to go ahead and get started. Um, I just want to first welcome all of you today and, and thank you for joining us for our webinar. Um, my name is Taylor and I am the curriculum design and training specialist here at Arizona State University Office of Community Health Engagement and Resiliency. Uh, we go by OCHER for short. Um, our goal here at OCHER is to co-create interventions with communities that focus on inherent strengths and assets that promote resiliency. Um, we provide trainings, webinars such as this one, and technical assistance on evidence-based trauma-informed practices and interventions um, specifically for community health workers. Um, but before we get started and introduce our presenter today, we would like to first acknowledge and honor the original caretakers of the land that ASU resides on by sharing this video created by ASU's Alliance of Indigenous Peoples, which is a student-led group that serves to represent and unite any and all self-identifying Indigenous voices at ASU. Arizona State University is located in Indian country. There are 22 tribal nations in Arizona. ASU's campuses are situated on the homelands of many indigenous peoples, including the Akamel Atham and Peeposh. Arizona State University recognizes the original inhabitants of these lands and recognizes that they still reside throughout the Phoenix metropolitan area. And we recognize the impact of their wisdom and generosity towards us. If you've flown into the valley, you have undoubtedly seen the Salt River Project canals that surround the area. Those modern day canals follow the framework of the canals originally constructed by ancestral Sonoran desert people, Uhukam, to make this area both livable and a place where peoples could thrive. We acknowledge that the modern day indigenous nations that descended from the ancestral peoples are the original inhabitants of this land. Alrighty. 
Sorry about the sound issues. I hope everyone was able to um, hear it after we got that figured out. It is a beautiful video. So, um, well, today uh, we are presenting um, protecting children from the health impacts of early adversity. And we're joined today by Dr. Heidi Pottinger. Uh, so just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please type them into the question box, which is um, in your Zoom control panel. So we will make sure that all of your questions get uh, asked by the end of the presentation. For any other comments, um, please use the chat function. Um, and also, as I mentioned earlier, we do have live Spanish uh, language interpretation that is brought to you by the Tucson Language Justice Collective and our two amazing interpreters, Natalia and Maria. If you would like to use the Spanish channel, please click the interpretation button on the Zoom control panel at the bottom of your screen and select Spanish. So now I'd like to introduce our presenter, um, Dr. Pottinger. So Dr. Heidi Pottinger is a research assistant professor at ASU's Office of Community Health Engagement and Resiliency here in Tucson. She's previously served as a director of clinical investigations and also as an instructor at the University of Arizona College of Public Health in the Department of Health Promotion Sciences. Previous to her time at the UA College of Public Health, she was the Director of Clinical Research for the Muscular Dystrophy Association National Headquarters in Tucson, Arizona. Over her career, she has focused extensively on advocacy, education, research, and service efforts. She has a doctorate in maternal and child health, a dual master's degree in biomedical and health ethics, and global family and child health, and a bachelor of science degree in plant biochemistry and molecular biology. She has been recognized by the American Public Health Association for her work evaluating an integrative wellness program in a pediatric hospital setting by the University of Arizona for her research in service to society and by the Tucson Hispanic Chamber of Commerce as a top 40 under 40. In 2018, Dr. Pottinger found Child Health and Resilience Mastery which is also referred to as CHARM. CHARM is a nonprofit serving children, families, and educators along the Ambos Nogales US-Mexico border region to strengthen their resilience in health promoting ways. CHARM was recently a recipient of the Community Impact Award from Arizona State University School of Social Work and a 2019 recipient of the Spirit Organizational Award from the Francis McClelland Institute for Children, Youth, and Families at the University of Arizona. As a proud mother of two and propelled by her lived experiences and training, she has a great passion for strengthening resilience in children and families. Dr. Pottinger is a certified trainer on the Nurtured Heart Approach and a certified Reiki pr practitioner. Her direct experiences with love, healing, and interconnectedness, especially when navigating grief, were the inspiration for Charm and their signature camp for the entire family, Camp Druzy. So I'm going to take this time to welcome Dr. Pottinger and pass this over to her. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Taylor, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm really happy to be here with you all today. And I'm just going to make sure that I've got my slides ready to share with you all. Um, 
And thank you to all of those of you who registered as well and, and plan to watch later. I just want to thank each of you for making the time to, to hear um, more about ways to protect children from the health impacts of early adversity today. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Can everybody see that okay? All right. So as Taylor mentioned, my name is Heidi. Um, I'm your presenter for today's webinar. And I just wanted to go over our agenda for today's webinar so you know what to expect and the items that we will cover over the next hour. So we'll start with a check-in and I actually wanted to try a different check-in um, in addition to the check-in that Taylor did earlier with everybody learning where you all are from. Um, I'll introduce myself a little bit more and then we'll dive into social determinants of health and just a brief overview of what, that, what those are. Um, we'll talk about resilience, ACEs, or adverse childhood experiences, and neuroplasticity. And then we're going to talk about protective factors, modifiable resilience factors, the seven C's of resilience. And then my hope is to be able to share stories um, from CHARM with you all in Camp Druzy. And then we'll have some time for reflections and Q&A. All right, so I thought we might do a quick check-in. Um, if you all want to share your name and a two-word check-in, this can be any two words you wish to share with the group today. Um, go ahead. So Rosie Simpson says, grateful and love. Thank you, Rosie. Christy Cap says, hope and forgiveness, loose empowerment and understanding. Shiloh, patience and grace. Diane says, empathy and patience. What a positive and amazing group of individuals. Thank you for sharing your two word check-ins. So you all must be very familiar with social and emotional learning, which we'll be talking about later. I can tell, I can feel it already. Um, so if you wanna also share, I just wanna test out the reactions button. Um, and, and I wanna encourage you and invite you all to use that reactions button throughout the webinar. So you can sort of give me an idea of what you're thinking or feeling throughout the presentation. Um, so go ahead and give us your weather report. How are you feeling right now? If you can share with the reactions button. It doesn't look like I'm seeing that at all, but we'll move on. <laughs> um, all right. So um, the, the first thing I wanted to try was just a quick mindfulness, uh, mindfulness exercise. Um, and I wanna invite you all to just put your feet on the ground and your hands in your lap if you feel comfortable and just take in a deep breath and slowly release. And I wanna try sharing um, just something you're grateful for that has happened over the past 24 hours, something that you wanna share with the group. Oh, now I'm seeing all the reactions. Thank you, everybody. Carmina is grateful she woke up. Yes. Irene is grateful for life, sunshine, completed taxes. 
Congratulations, Rosie will be a grandma soon. Diane, happy to have met a new community action team. Aruni, my kids, ha having to hug them. Wonderful, thank you all for sharing. I think everybody's feeling good, I hope. Um, and I just wanna thank you for participating in that intentional check-in. So um, a little bit about me, um, if you can see here, on this slide, these are my related work experiences. So things that I've done in my life that I think are relevant to share with you all today that Taylor um, went over so beautifully, thank you. Um, and I just wanna start by saying, I'm grateful to be here with you all as a member of the OCHER team at ASU under the leadership of Dr. Mary Ellen Brown. Um, and I just wanna begin by thanking Dr. Brown, Margaret Palmer, Taylor Dominguez, Bianca Levario, um, and everybody who you know, invited me to present today, um, as well as our interpreters, Natalia and Maria, and our tech support team, Jesus and Zoe. Um, so I'd like to introduce myself as a mother, a child and family advocate, a researcher, a writer, a deep listener, and more. Um, formerly, I'm a research assistant professor, and I, I do wanna say and share that while I don't necessarily consider myself an expert in the topics we will be discussing today. Um, I've learned a lot in my life, both firsthand as well as through my extensive training in research, public health, maternal and child health, and more. Um, I'm a great believer in following the evidence in strengths-based approaches, and I'm humbly sharing what I've learned so far with you all today. Um, I also want to share that I'm originally from Nogales, Arizona, located along the U.S.-Mexico border, and have worked with children and families, in particular um, families with children who have complex health or medical needs, grieving families and individuals with disabilities through both local and international contexts for about 11 years now. All right, so let's begin. Um, social determinants of health. Most of you have probably learned about this topic a great deal. Um, if not formally, what I think is vital to know is that as CHWs, you are already making a hands-on impact across all five domains that we will review next. Um, and the definition that I've cited here is from Healthy People 2023, and it's widely accepted. Um, and you can go ahead and read it along with me. It defines social determinants of health as the conditions in the environments where people are born, live, learn, work, play, worship, and age that affect a wide range of health functioning and quality of life outcomes and risks. And what's also important to know is that the context in which people live, learn, work, and play, as you all know, um, influences both the choices available to people and their ability to choose paths leading to good health. So in many instances, the barriers to good health may often exceed an individual's abilities, even if they have the greatest motivation to overcome these obstacles. Um, and so this is where you all know as CHWs, you can and do play a significant and valued role in helping influence the choices available to people and the steps taken on paths toward good health in more equitable ways. So let's go over the um, five different domains that you see here. They include economic stability, education access and quality, healthcare access and quality, neighborhood and built environment, and social and community context. Um, some examples of socioeconomic influences may include housing, crime, noise, pollution, availability of green spaces, and a variety of other influences that you all are familiar with um, as you help people navigate these issues such as healthcare access, education access, and so forth. Um, and I think it's also really important to note that these influences include discrimination. Um, so an example of discrimination that's not often talked about as often, for example, might be ableism, um, which can be defined in multiple ways. 
One definition of ableism is the belief that falsely characterizes persons with a disability as inferior by default, when in truth, disability is just another way for a mind and or body to be. And so like other forms of discrimination, racism, um, ableism can be internalized as well as extend beyond the individual. So that's structurally, medically, financially, legally, and culturally. And so these conditions or circumstances in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age that impact our health are also shaped by socio-ecological systems, many of which we have no agency or control over. And these systems include interconnected environments and resources at various levels, which include the individual, micro, exo, and macro systems. So at the individual level, for example, we're shaped by factors such as our gender, our age, our biology, this includes our DNA. Um, at the micro level, we are shaped by influences such as our family, who our peers are, the schools we go to, the health services we have available to us, and so forth. Um, so here's a depiction of Brenner's socio-ecological model, which I took from chapter three of the textbook, Public Health Perspectives on Disability. And as you go through each of the nested systems, keep in mind that this figure was missing a key variable or system, the chrono system, which is time. And so I added that here um, in blue on the, on the X axis at the bottom. Um, and it was also missing another key element, which is the bi-directional influence between the various systems. So I added those bi-directional arrows in blue to depict, depict this between each nested level of the model. All right. So the social determinants of health that you see here on the screen um, are influenced by these bi-directional nested systems. They include the biological, economic, and social factors that influence our health status over time. So as I mentioned, examples are, are gender. They also include employment and work conditions, income, social class, social supports and coping skills, access to healthcare, our physical environment, exposure to crime, exposure to adverse childhood experiences or ACEs, also exposure to positive childhood experiences or PCEs and healthy behaviors, job stress and numerous other factors. So over time, uh, individuals hopefully begin to have some agency or control over some of these factors, especially if they are empowered in their environments and their communities to do so. So this brings me to the next section, which includes key ways to promote health if we can address these social determinants in equitable ways. Um, by focusing on some of these upstream factors, we can promote better health outcomes for everyone. And so the three key socioeconomic components or upstream factors that lead to better health are listed for you here um, in black. They are education, income, and occupation. And the reason is the key contextual flat, uh, factors gleaned or that we obtain from um, education, income, and, and occupation that either hinder or empower people all along their life course to engage in healthy behaviors include what you see here in these different boxes. So environmental exposures um, all across the lifespan, right? This includes um, in utero, um, social networks and social cohesion, architectural and aesthetic features of communities. So, you know, community beautification projects, neighborhood beautification projects, um, access to and quality of healthcare, lifestyle behaviors, and then chronic stress levels to either support or negatively impact health. Um, and there's many more. And we also know that socioeconomic status um, or socioeconomic components or factors have an impact on our thoughts and our feelings and our behaviors. And these three things, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors can be changed in empowering health promoting ways. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I also placed stars on all of these key contextual factors because this is where CHWs can and do make an impact.
All right, so how else can we promote health? Um, and one way I love to talk about is modifiable resilience factors. So these are resources that positively impact the social environment. Um, they ameliorate the effects of ACEs or adverse childhood experiences, or even better, they prevent them. Um, and they help to strengthen our health and our resiliency. And the key is to design these resources in equitable ways. And we will cover what these factors are in a bit. Um, but first, I just want to talk a little bit about what is resilience exactly. And um, different people define resilience in different ways. So generally, um, resilience is the human ability to rebuild or come back from difficult situations. Some descriptions of resilience that I'll share from people aging with multiple sclerosis, for example, in their own words, um, include bouncing back or being buoyant, rolling with or dancing with a disability, taking things one day at a time, while also planning for the future, that's important, finding a new normal as life changes, making the best of life with a disability, trusting that stressful times will pass like the weather. So just some examples from this community of people aging with multiple sclerosis in their words. Um, and if you would please share what resilience means to you in the chat. And I'll give you all a minute. Dee says, rolling with the punches. Rosie, overcoming a difficulty. Lauren says, strength. Roel, being able to bounce back after some negative experience. Christy, willing to try again. Se fuerte, Karina. Moving beyond challenges, Karen. Moving forward with purpose after difficulties, Morgan. Ana says, rebuild myself after difficult events. Thank you. All right, so I've been asked to speak slower <laughs> for our interpreters. I apologize. Um, so how else can we promote health? Um, through community re resilience. And, and we can take this a bit deeper so we can nurture resilient environments. Um, so for populations with a disability, for example, these are those ways that support a person's needs by providing the assistive technology, accessible environments, and supportive relationships necessary to access formal and informal supports. Um, you'll see here in this graphic that the Center for Community Resilience has this um, depiction of what community re resilience looks like with the fertile soil being equitable and trauma-informed systems and supports. And so factors at the systems level that drive community outcomes. Um, the roots here are shown as being health-promoting infrastructure, affordable housing, community-driven policy, living wages, and so forth. And what grows from these roots and this healthy soil then are the leaves you see here depicted in blue, green and orange, safe and stable neighborhoods, environments that promote social connectedness, access to capital, healthy and supported individuals and families, and more. What else is missing from this image to depict community resilience? You can share your thoughts in the chat. What else might be missing? Clean air and water, Roel. Absolutely. How else will the tree grow, right? Without those foundational environmental supports. Um, thank you. All right, so resilient environments. Um, Let's talk a little bit about these when we're working with vulnerable populations. Um, so as we mentioned, 
part of the soil must be trauma informed. And that means that we should assume that those we're working with have experienced either an adverse childhood experience, may currently be experiencing trauma, or have experienced trauma during their adult life. Um, we know that early adversity has lasting impacts into adulthood and ACEs have been linked to risky health behaviors, multiple chronic health conditions, disabling conditions, low life potential and early mortality. So as you know, the number of ACEs as these increase, so do the risk for poor outcomes. Um, the good news is that there are ways to prevent ACEs and against the negative outcomes associated with them. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Arizona, where I live, um, just in general, for example, and also because unfortunately Arizona ranks worst in the US with 31% of children ages 0 to 17 having been exposed to two or more ACEs. Um, to give you an idea, the national average is 20, about 23%. So. Um, 31 versus 23%. And worse, over 44% of Arizona children ages 12 to 17 have experienced two or more, um, whereas the national average is 30. And when we're talking about vulnerable populations in healthcare, um, we're talking about those with a chronic illness or disability, the very old or the very young, um, those who are low income or homeless individuals, LGBTQ plus populations and certain geographical communities. Um, children with intellectual and developmental disabilities, for example, are at greater risk of abuse and neglect than the general population and they report greater exposure to ACEs as do these other vulnerable populations. Um, so let's remember the bi-directional influence of the nested systems that we talked about and chronosystem time that we talked about earlier. Um, ACEs have been found to be associated with developing a disability later in life. And so the strong association of ACEs with poor health outcomes requires us to systematically address ACEs by taking steps to prevent them when possible or ameliorate, ameliorating their effects. And there are ways to do this. Um, we know, for example, that educational attainment and degree of upward mobility in society in a child's surrounding environment will reduce these odds of developing a disability or having these poor health outcomes later in life. So I'm going to jump to neuroplasticity really quick. <laughs> and um, neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain to form, reorganize, and make new connections, especially in response to learning or experiencing um, something new or following an injury. Um, we see the power of neuroplasticity with people who have had a stroke, with children who have cerebral palsy, um, and if we can intervene early as much as possible and in ways that are engaging, the brain will be more prone to make new connections and we can harness this neuroplasticity. So think about a child who is riding a bike on a path. If you teach the child a new path and they have opportunities to take that new path more and more, they'll automatically start to take that new path as their default, you know, all the weeds and plants that were growing in that path will sort of disappear and that path will become stronger and more writable. Um, and so as we sort of like transition into positive childhood experiences and the power of neuroplasticity and the power of modifying um, resilience factors, I'd like to know how do you see examples of this in your own work of neuroplasticity in action, for example? And I think of children with spastic CP, for example, spastic cerebral palsy and the work that, um, that I've done with this population for young babies who have received active, repetitive, intensive therapies following an early injury to the central nervous system um, and being able to intervene early with active, repetitive, intensive child-driven therapies, creating new pathways in the brain. Um, children and parents who were told they may never walk, being able to walk, run, jump, join gymnastics. 
So it doesn't have to be such a um, significant change, right? Neuroplasticity can, can be seen in very small changes as well. Toby says, I've seen this in PT working with children. Yes, exactly. So the intervention I'm talking about is a physical and occupational therapy intervention. Absolutely, the brain is very powerful. There are many ways to harness neuroplasticity and there are many ways to do that to improve modifiable resilience factors. Um, Okay, so as we harness neuroplasticity, as we make new connections, um, we have more cognitive resources available to us. And so things like the, you know, the children that I described earlier who are able to now walk, run, jump, um, be in gymnastics, etc. Now their cognitive resources are more available for other things like language development and so on. Um, so I'm sure you can imagine what this might do for a mother's mental health, for example, right, which is a modifiable resilience factor. Um, Morgan says demonstrating ways to self regulate mindfulness with children in crisis. D says seeing a nonverbal autistic child say words. Yes, gives me the chills. Absolutely. And um, neuroplasticity also influences our feelings, our thoughts, our behaviors. So if we can intervene early, we have a greater likelihood of making new positive connections and children have more opportunities to practice them at a greater rate and their new default pattern of feeling, thinking and behaving now changes. Okay, so neuroplasticity and ACEs. Um, as you all know, ACEs, and, and we mentioned earlier, they can accumulate um, and their effects last beyond childhood, well into adulthood, can even be intergenerational. Um, children who repeatedly and chronically experience adversity can suffer from toxic stress, which happens when the brain endures repeated stress or danger and then releases flight or flight hormones like cortisol. Um, and this internal alarm system increases our heart rate, their blood pressure, it damages the digestive and immune systems, it can disrupt organs, tissue, and brain development over time, and it can limit a person's executive functioning and their ability to regulate emotions. So when families experience historical and systemic racism or live in poverty um, over generations, the effects of ACEs can really add up over time. And this is why it's so important to provide resources that wrap around the family system as much as possible, and also why we work to strengthen resilient environments for all children. So aside from neuroplasticity, when we're thinking of the different nested systems, right, and we're right now we were focusing on the individual, um, there are also five modifiable resilience factors that have been proven to improve children's long and short term health outcomes. And these are evidence based proactive protective factors um, that protect children from the health impacts of early adversity. You can read more about this in the uh, pediatrics journal that I've cited at the bottom of the slide. Um, but the top five are listed here. They're all factors that we focus on at CHARM, the nonprofit that I mentioned earlier when, when I introduced myself or when Taylor introduced me. Um, and so these five factors are proven ways for pr improving their short and long-term health outcomes in the face of adversity. They can strengthen health and well-being for the next generation. They can reduce spending on healthcare for chronic diseases and more. So in this review article, the authors defined resilience as good mental and physical health despite the assails of early adversity, the ability to withstand, adapt to, and recover from adversities. And what's important too is that the authors, they recognize that resilience is not inherent to the child. The child is not born being resilient, but um, instead, you know, this resilience results from a complex interplay between the different systems we talked about, the child's genetics, natural temperament, knowledge and skills, past experiences, social supports, and cultural and societal resources. So we'll go through uh, the list on the next slide. So 
So here are the five modifiable resilience factors that the authors identified as ways to promote resilience through prevention, intervention, and policy changes. Um, we have fostering positive appraisal styles and executive function skills, improving responsive positive parenting skills, supporting and treating maternal mental health issues, teaching parents the importance of good self-care skills and consistent household routines, and offering guidance or enhancing understanding about the impact of trauma on children. So let's start with the first resilience factor, fostering positive appraisal styles. So several researchers have identified a positive appraisal style as being predictive of resilience. Um, and what this means is essentially focusing on the strengths of the child or even the strengths or uh, of an experience itself. So a positive way of communicating, having positive expectations about the future and so forth. And this sounds a little bit like wishy-washy, right? But it's a very real way to improve short and long-term health outcomes for children. Um, I'll share, uh, for example, in a prospective study of children, positive expectations about the future were actually found to be significantly associated with future lower rates of depression. Um, and so one way that we practice this at CHARM that I can share is by modeling and teaching a positive appraisal style called nurtured heart approach, which focuses on three stands. And so what are the three stands of nurtured heart? I'll share them with you now, just to give you an idea. Um, the first stand is absolutely no. I refuse to give my time, energy, and relationship to negative behavior. I will not accidentally foster failure, nor will I reward problems by responding to them in animated ways. I will save my time and energy for searching for success. And as you're thinking about nurtured heart approach and who might be utilizing this approach, think about parents, think about teachers, right? Think about yourself. Um, absolutely, yes. I will relentlessly and strategically pull the child into new patterns of success. I will constantly recognize the success and achievement that children are displaying, no matter how small, and present them with clear, undeniable evidence of their value and how great they are. Number three, absolutely clear. I will have clear and consistent consequences for children when a rule has been broken. Here are the rules. Here's what happens when you break a rule. So these three stands are simple, and honestly, it took me a while to implement them consistent, consistently myself, both at home and, and in the community. But once you do, the results are profound. Um, I've seen this approach change the way parents interact with their families, with their children um, in a short period of time. So I can talk a little bit about that later. And the second half of that first modifiable resilience factor is fostering executive function skills. So what is what does this mean, executive function skills? Um, think of an air traffic control system. So like, you know, we're here at the air traffic control system at a busy airport. We're managing the arrivals and departures of dozens of planes on multiple runways. And in the brain, this air traffic control mechanism is called executive function. So it controls our ability to focus. Um, hold and work with information in mind, to filter distractions, and to switch gears. So researchers have identified strong executive function as predictive of resilience. And so as you might expect, early adversity and poverty in childhood are both associated with lower levels of executive function. Higher executive function in a three-year-old, um, for example, has been shown to be associated with more positive parenting ratings and in infancy, which is the first part of that modifiable resilience factor. Um, this is likely due to lower stress hormone activation in the parent, which makes perfect sense. And I've shared a little bit about um, some of the, uh, or I'm actually going to do that on the next slide. So what are the fundamental skills of executive function? We've got seven of them listed for you here. Um, and what these behaviors facilitate or what they what these skills facilitate sorry are the behaviors required to plan and achieve goals so the fundamental skills related to uh, executive function include proficiency and adaptable thinking planning self-monitoring self-control working memory time management and organization 
you think about a three-year-old and you're thinking like, what do they know about organization, right? But these competencies are essential to children's growth and their ability to learn. Um, and while the development begins in early childhood, these skills will continue to progress and grow well into adulthood. So they start, they, you know, we start young with executive functioning um, and continue to grow and master these skills over time. So struggling with, with many executive functions may be a symptom of a learning difference, such as ADHD or dyslexia. And guess what? Um, research grounded positive appraisal styles, like we said, the first modifiable resilience factor, the first part of that, like nurtured heart approach, have been shown to reduce these symptoms. ADHD symptoms, for example, the need for ADHD medication, even referrals for treating these learning differences. Um, social and emotional learning, which we'll talk about, like the Choose Love movement that we promote in Arizona through CHARM, also boost executive functioning in children in spite of ACEs. So let's talk a little bit about social and emotional learning, and let me see how much time we've got left. Um, so as I mentioned before, we talked about the three SES components that impact health. Um, and education is one of those, and it may be the most basic component. And, and why is that? Um, education shapes our future job opportunities, our earning potential. It also provides people with knowledge and life skills. And as you all know, higher income allows people to obtain better nutrition, housing, school, recreational opportunities, and healthcare. And we also know that successful interventions often target specific communities, such as schools. So the reason that is, is there's more control over the environment in the school. So this is just one reason why we look at social and emotional learning in schools um, to promote some of these modifiable resilience factors. All right. So at CHARM, we promote an SEL framework called Choose Love. There are many SEL frameworks um, that might be more suitable for your community. Um, this one, you know, in particular was started by a mother out of Sandy Hook, um, whose son Jesse passed away or was killed in the Sandy Hook um, elementary school shooting. Um, and one of the last, you know, things that he wrote on the family's kitchen chalkboard were the words nurturing, healing, love. And his mom read those words as a precognitive message that had the uh, shooter been able to give and receive nurturing, healing, love, the tragedy never would have happened. And from those three words developed this choose love formula that you see on the screen. So courage plus gratitude plus forgiveness plus compassion equals the choose love formula. And the formula teaches children, educators, families, ways to thoughtfully respond to any situation, circumstance, or interaction. Um, and knowing that we can't always control what will happen to us, but we can control and learn how to control how to thoughtfully respond and how we respond to help ourselves feel safe, calm, to change our thoughts, to practice positive coping skills, and, and so on. So um, you'll see here in this diagram, you know, students learn to take a brave breath, a gratitude breath, and so on. They practice techniques such as mindfulness, emotional freedom technique, which you may know as tapping, um, the havening technique, which is another technique to elicit the relaxation response and get children out of their amygdalas and, and um, and really empower themselves to think differently and respond differently and helping their brains to, to develop a new default, right? Using your art, their neuroplasticity, a, a new way of responding over time. Um, so, you know, I know, oh, let's see. I'm looking at the chat here. I think that was another ABA. Yes, a very great tool. Um, so there's many resources and communities across the world. Um, to help children cope with stress, to improve their resiliency. And I'd, I'd be interested in learning more about some of the ways your communities help empower families to respond to stress. If you wanna share some of those in the chat, and we, I think a few of you all mentioned, Morgan here talks about ways of self-regulation, mindfulness with children in crisis. This, we're speaking the same language.
Okay. As some of those examples come in, um, I just want to share a little bit about why. Why is social and emotional learning so powerful? Um, and scientific research proves that teaching evidence-based SEL in the classroom significantly benefits all children. This includes children with special needs, um, and that includes improvements um, academically, behaviorally, physically, mentally, and socio-emotionally. Um, I'm going to list a long list of, of the benefits um, that SEL in the classroom results in. And this includes improvements in social cognitive skills, self-control, um, and frustration tolerance, decreases in anxiety, depression, sadness, and withdrawal, improved classroom atmosphere, less aggression, and, self and less self-destructive behaviors, um, less drug use initiation, better scores on standardized achievement tests, more assertive social skills, effective conflict resolution, and increased pro-social behaviors, um, less violence, and more empathy, and the list goes on and on. Rosie says inviting parents to participate in playgroups, absolutely. Yeah, providing that opportunity for social connection. Allowing opportunities for creativity, self-expression, different types of play, play is healing, says Morgan, and resources for families, absolutely. And we're gonna talk about that as we talk about the seven C's of um, resiliency and, and how actually creativity really should be one of those um, C's as well. Um, the other great thing about social and emotional learning is that it can be incorporated into routine education practice and it actually helps the economy. Um, so Columbia University did a report where they assessed six SEL programs and they found that for every dollar that was invested, there was actually an $11 net present value return to the community. So SEL can't address all of the many macro system issues, but as a micro system intervention, it really has excellent potential for positively impacting the child, the family, the community, and especially when it's designed and delivered in an inclusive trauma-informed way. All right, so we're gonna quickly go through the other modifiable resilience factors as a group. Um, the next one being supporting or treating maternal mental health issues. So can you share some ways that you all in your communities work to support maternal mental health issues? And I imagine definitely linking mothers to those resources, those supports in the community is one way. Karen says you have new programs beginning. That's wonderful to hear. Offering parenting classes, assistance applying for Medicaid. So the question is, what are some examples of ways that you support maternal mental health issues in your community? Support groups and parenting circles. Absolutely. Yes, and you know, as you know, um, Mothers are part of a family system, and it's an intense, emotionally interconnected unit. Um, so when something happens with one member of the family, it affects everybody, um, especially when when the mother's matern when the mother's mental health is impacted. Um, but that you know, the mother's m mental health is influenced by so many different factors. Um, so. Let's see, Diane says new pre-perinatal programs, doulas, community health workers for linking to resources. That was exactly what I was gonna say, Diane, is when a family is in crisis, all the mother might want is a resource, right? To, to be able to address the, 
the root cause for that crisis, especially if, for example, a child is ill um, and something is happening and they really need, you know, the support that, that you all can link them to. Um, so that has a huge impact on maternal mental health. Rosie says we provide monthly home visits with pregnant moms and until their child turns two, so they have a unique opportunity to share resources in the community. Wonderful. All right, what about um, teaching parents the importance of good self-care skills and consistent household routines? Ruel says a nurse family partnership. And the reason this one is important is because this offers that resilience factor that we'll talk about next as part of the seven C's of resilience, um, which is control. So if a child feels as if they have some level of control over their life, over their environment, they know what to expect every day with that consistent household routine, um, then that will increase their, their resiliency. And then lastly, we have offering guidance or enhancing understanding about the impact of trauma on children. So if parents know, um, have more education, access to resources for how their child may be impacted by traumatic environments or situations um, and in age appropriate ways, then they can feel more empowered to intervene um, to potentially um, change their behaviors or find resources to support um, new pathways for, for healthier um, environments for their children. Morgan says the reassurance that her family is safe and all their immediate needs will be met while at the shelter with us. Foundational, absolutely foundational. Yes. Thank you. All right, and so these five modifiable resilience uh, factors last well into adulthood. Um, and we're gonna talk about modifiable resilience factors or the seven C's for building resilience, which are a bit separate um, from the five listed before. So these were outlined by Dr. Kenneth Ginsberg in an article which was published by Healthy Children Magazine. And um, let me share that article with you all in the chat. Or I might, might need to share that a little bit later, but I will share it at the end of this um, presentation. Um, and so the article shares specific guidelines for parents to help strengthen um, resiliency in their child which includes strengthening the following. So coping, you'll see them here on the screen. I'm gonna go a little bit out of order. Coping, confidence, connection, character, contribution, control, and competence. And as I mentioned before, um, at CHARM, we have a few C's of our own that are proven ways for strengthening resiliency, um, which are creativity and culture. So when we work with families, what we try to do um, at, at TARM and, and, and many other you know, organizations are all over the world um, is to really provide opportunities for building these elements of resilience earlier after experiencing adversity. Um, we focus on um, intervening early when, when children and families are suffering from a death or extended separation from a close family member. So they're navigating grief. Um, and, and the idea of the mission really is not to just strengthen a child and family's ability to rebuild or bounce back, but really to empower them to grow from these experiences, to experience post-traumatic growth as well in ways that help them to handle future adversity, to promote well-being, um, and to create healthy and safe environments from the inside out. And here you can see a little bit about what each of these seven C's of resilience mean, right? So coping, um, it talks about ways for managing stress, engaging and disengaging, breaking down tasks, avoiding triggers, letting go, um, contribution, so offering their own experience and service to their world, confidence. So you can see here, uh, one of our campers is learning a, to juggle, which actually is a great way to build confidence. Um, and, and just really being able to recognize, you know, when somebody's doing something right, 
um, and, and being able to practice and have the opportunities to develop weaker skills. Um, control, so feeling, as we mentioned earlier, with the consistent household routines um, and self-care. So really feeling like they have some level of control over their lives and their environment. Um, character, which is built you know, through social and emotional learning for sure. Um, understanding of right and wrong, the ability to follow a moral compass. Oh, sorry about that. And then competence. Okay, so aside from really fostering all of these modifiable resilience factors, um, we can also create opportunities for positive childhood experiences, which is a new movement that's growing and picking up steam, um, or PCEs that protect children from adversity. And, and why these are important intuitively um, is that positive childhood experiences, the more that you experience them, um, they, they show a dose response with um, adult mental health and relational health later in life. So in other words, even children who have experienced ACEs, multiple ACEs, um, the more they have opportunities to engage in positive childhood experiences, they um, will actually have a better lifelong mental and relational health outcome than those that have fewer positive childhood experience opportunities. So what are the seven childhood positive childhood experiences? Um, you can see them listed here. And these have been identified as the ability to talk with family about feelings, um, which is something we definitely work on at Charm and Camp Druzy and is something that really I experienced personally, you know, having experienced a, a, an overwhelming amount of uh, loss at a very young age was um, we didn't really talk about it. Um, and I think a lot of times parents feel as if maybe their child is too young, um, is not maybe experiencing these emotions, or perhaps they don't know what to say. Um, they don't want to make things worse. But um, the research really shows that if you can talk to your family and you ha a child feels comfortable sharing feelings and emotions um, with their family, that this is a, considered a positive childhood experience. Um, and you know, in connection with that, feeling um, feeling an actual experience where the, where they feel like their family is supportive in difficult times, and um, grief being definitely a difficult time, and an example um, that I can share more about with Camp Jersey. Um, enjoyment and participating in community traditions is definitely um, a positive childhood experience, and um, participating in community traditions can include you know very young at a very young age in, in school, um, at church, in different settings. Feeling a sense of belonging, and this has actually extended to um, be more specific. So feeling a sense of belonging in high school is a positive childhood experience. Um, the feeling of being supported by friends. And then lastly, having at least two non-parent adults who they feel generally, genuinely care about them. So this can be a teacher, a pastor, um, a family member, some other non-parent adult in their life. All right. So I just want to share a little bit about um, my work with Charm and Camp Truzy and what does this actually look like in reality when we combine modifiable resilience factors, the seven C's of resiliency, and opportunities for positive childhood experiences. Um, so Camp Truzy is a four-day um, overnight camp that is offered to grieving families with children in Santa Cruz County along the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, we prioritize um, families who are um, low income. Um, so in order for, for us to receive a referral, the child um, needs to meet the criteria of grieving a death or an extended separation from a close family member. Um, they should qualify for free or reduced lunch at school. Um, and that's it. And they attend with their entire family, um, which is really important um, to really be able to heal together as a family system. Um, and so I want to share a little bit about the outcomes of this experience and, and some of the activities. So um, to give you some context, so, you know, activities include 
teaching and modeling the nurtured heart approach that we talked about earlier. So the positive appraisal style, positive parenting technique. Um, there's a lot of creativity um, that is utilized in connection with um, some trauma techniques, um, such as EMDR, um, emotional freedom technique that we talked about, the tapping. Um, we have music therapy, ecotherapy, pet therapy. You can see a picture of Ruby here on the top right with one of the families doing our opening ceremony. Um, and then on the top left, you can see Abril. Um, she's actually on a horse. You can't tell from this photo, but maybe through her helmet um, and her smile. She's having a great time. And then at the bottom here are, are two different families um, embracing and just really enjoying um, being together and healing together as a community. Um, and so I want to share a little bit about the reported resiliency outcomes um, that we see in this four day experience. So for the children who participated, uh, children and youth ages five and up are asked to complete a pre post survey before and after camp. Um, and what we saw after the four days was that for children and youth ages five and up there were there was an average overall increase in self-reported resiliency scores. So they're responding to these measures themselves. Um, and especially for questions related to academic achievement, positive coping skills, having role models, and feeling a greater sense of connection um, or fitting in with other kids. So we're checking off a lot of the boxes that we talked about earlier um, that are positive childhood experiences that really protect early adversity, protect children from early adversity. Older children ages 10 and up were able to answer additional self-reported measures of resiliency. And we saw average increases across the um, those listed here for ages uh, children ages five and up, um, but also with um, the following. So they um, were, able, were seeing increases in their perception or per their perceived ability to handle hard times. Now I know I can handle hard times. I can change important things in my life. So that sense of control. Um, I discovered I am stronger than I thought I was. Confidence. I feel a sense of well-being from a connection with nature. And so interconnectedness um, with their environment. And on average, all of the youth reported top-notch scores with how happy they were with their experience, um, an average of nine and a half to 10 out of a, on a scale from zero to 10. So let's move on to adults. So the adults um, also showed increases for all of the questions that I talked about before. And even with a small sample size, um, we were able to see statistically significant increases for the following four resiliency measures. So again, I can change important things in my life. I have a greater sense of closeness with others. Now I know I can handle hard times. I discovered I am stronger than I thought I was. And what's really cool is this overall well being um, increase, which we use the Arizona Integrative Outcome Scale, um, which measures their self rated overall well being, um, which includes their sense of spiritual, social, emotional, mental, and physical well being. And so the adult participants, and that includes some of um, the adult children that participated. So we had some, some children who were um, just eight, had just turned 18, um, reported average increases of 31.3% greater overall well-being after camp. And those ranged from 13 and a half to 50% increases. So these principles, they really work um, even over a short period of time. Which, which we were able to show in this four day period of time. So those are the measures of resiliency that we've seen. And I just wanted to share a little bit um, about the Ruiz family um, and their story of success, what this looked and felt like for the Ruiz family. Um, they've given me permission to share this with you all. So the Ruiz family participated in Camp Jersey last summer. Um, and as I mentioned, it included four days of experiences for families to learn evidence-based resiliency building skills and tools, strengthen confidence, nurture a sense of connection, 
practice creativity and so so much more so family members connect with other grieving children and adults from the community um, and together we hold space to really transform grief in meaningful ways um, in a comfortable and fun setting so we're really focusing on strength um, and on resiliency and so the Therese family was referred to us um, they were grieving two family members the mother's parents had both passed within weeks of each other and the surviving family members include um, Hugo Enrique dad Connie mom Camila 10 she's 10 years old now she's 11 Enrique who's eight um, and throughout the short period of time that we were with them we quickly learned that the family had actually been living in their car um, they had lost their home they were no longer able to afford rent as a result of their losses um, and so this experience really, you know, provided an opportunity for them to go into a different setting um, and really just um, am humbled by the fact that they, they trusted us um, to join this experience. Um, and yeah, so on day one of the, so it's an overnight program. And on day one, it was really clear that the dad had a healthy skepticism um and his heart was open so that was the key for him and the mother was definitely more optimistic um the entire family was really deeply grieving the death of her two parents and so one of the things that connie shared um honestly during a circle about their story their challenges as parents um was how she was always asking her husband to be more affectionate um, and he, and the dad agrees. He says, you know, siempre me reclama mi mujer. You know, he needs to be more um, uh, affectionate with her. Um, and so on day two, we are sharing during our check-in, just like we did today with you all. You know, we ask campers to volunteer to share something they're grateful for over the past twenty-four hours or a takeaway from the prior day. Um, and Hugo Enrique stood up first and he said he was agnostico. He says, you know, I'm agnostic. And he went into detail about what that meant for those who might not know. Um, and he shared in Spanish that as a result of the experiences he'd had during camp on the first day that he now, without a doubt, believes in a higher power. Um, he says, I felt it for myself. Um, and this was probably during, uh, as he described during one of the um, Reiki sessions. And so it really completely changed the way that he interacted with his family, um, how he engaged in camp for the remainder of the time. He really became openly affectionate um, with, with his family. He started communicating with his children in strengths-based ways and just really encouraged everybody to lean in during camp um, and embrace the rest of the activities wholeheartedly. So even now, a year later, when when you know I communicate with him, he still has this positive mindset. Um, his wife shared with me recently a few weeks ago that camp pulled him out of a depression and changed their family's life. Um, he was able to regain the workforce after that, and she was able to go back um, and spend more time with her kids at home instead of out working. Um, to make ends meet. And so, you know, in addition, the the mother, the children, they also thrived during camp. Um, just with a little positive reinforcement using the nurtured heart approach, the son was really highly engaged afterward and took an active role in making sure others were cared for. You know, he's a real high energy kid. And so, I, you know, in talking to the parents, we would just say, well, you know, he really, you can see he really cares about how others are doing why don't we let him take the reins for um, one of the therapy dogs, Odin, this giant Irish wolfhound. Um, and he can, that can be his job to check in with every family that he thinks, you know, would benefit from Odin. Um, and so he just took, took it and ran with it. And the, the parents really just realized, hey, wait a minute. Yeah, we can focus on his strengths. Um, and it was a really beautiful thing to, to kind of watch that blossom. Um, the other uh, really great thing that I can share too is Camila. So the little girl, she really shined in her creativity, um, her leadership skills, her ability to connect with the animals. And on the last day of camp, she actually volunteered to co-lead the group um, 
to help them shake their fears, to feel more calm and confident and connected before the equine sessions, which a lot of the families are, the kiddos were experiencing a lot of like anxiety and fear over. And so she really led everybody in this emotional freedom technique um, and tapping. And then she showed everybody her brave breath and she showed everybody her brave pose. Um, and just, it was a really great thing to see um, the transformation over those, those few days. So um, I will say lastly, that the parents also received uh, employment after camp and one of our through one of our volunteers, they continue to work there today. And so their, their lives really transformed. Um, and I'll write the follow or I'll read the following testimonial in Spanish. Um, so the mom says that Camp Druzy es una experiencia excelente para las personas que pasamos por periodos de duelo en diferentes niveles. En el caso de nuestra familia, fue más allá de nuestro dolor y nos ayudó tanto de manera espiritual, mental y física a conocer nuestro interior, poder sacar dolores, ser resilientes y realistas en tiempo actual. Gracias a Charm y a todos los voluntarios y patrocinadores. Um, in English, she said, Camp Druzy is an excellent experience for people going through periods of mourning at different levels. In the case of our family, it went beyond our pain and helped us both in a spiritual, mental, and physical way to know our interior, to be able to relieve pain, to be resilient and realistic in real time. Thanks to Charm and all the volunteers and donors. Um, so that's the Ruiz family and their story. And I just wanna close, um, here's an example of Camila she, on the fourth day of camp that I mentioned to you all where she was <laughs> showing everybody, leading everybody in the emotional freedom technique. Um, and showing everybody her brave pose. Um, can you all tell me which one of the seven C's of resilience is she modeling? And you can share that in the chat. So coping, definitely practicing coping. Courage, for sure. Confidence, absolutely. Participation, yeah, connection. Control. Awesome. Yeah, and I just want to add too that you know a lot of the families would share with me later that they they would find their children in their rooms practicing this technique as well. So, um, you know, our children um, are really receptive; their brains are ready, and they're really just waiting for these positive experiences. Rosie says all of them. Yeah. All right, well, that's that's all I have for now. Um, so I just wanted to um, maybe share a little bit about what your greatest takeaways were from this presentation. And maybe we can go over any questions. So if you have any takeaways that you wanna share, share them in the chat, your greatest takeaway. Thank you, Sonia. Karen says support can make a difference in families' lives. Lou says trauma-informed approaches are key, especially with this population. Yes. Realizing that there is recovery for children and families. Querer es poder. Rosie. Toby says, we must support our children so they can grow to support others. Yes, exactly. This is intergenerational healing. Diane says, it's humbling how transformational learning new skills can be when utilizing a validating and strengths-based approach. Yes. 
Proel says our agency tries to help people manage their diabetes. So we currently don't screen for ACEs, but I think we should to help them understand how that affects their physical health. Absolutely. And our team at OCHER is actually working on toolkits to support you all in this work. Um, so definitely link back with us later for, for access to those resources. Kevin says, importance of positive support when children and families have been hurt. <laughs> thank you, Barbara. Well, thank you all. I've listed um, our website here. If you have any other questions, um, feel free to reach out to me at any time. Um, my email address I can share with you all in the chat. Actually, it doesn't look like I have that option, but it's Heidi dot pottinger at asu dot edu h e i d i dot p o t t i n g e r at asu dot edu and heidi we do have two questions one that popped up in the chat and one that's in the q a so is it okay if we spend the last five minutes just talking through those yeah i'd love to okay perfect so the first question came from Morgan Maxwell. Um, she is asking if you can go more into the nurturing heart approach. Um, mm -hmm. What is it meant by negative behavior and not giving any time to it? And if no time is given to a behavior, how can we teach to improve the behavior or deal with those tough feelings? Yeah. Um, so I just want to make sure that I, uh, if you could hold me accountable, Taylor, to answering all the parts of her question. Um, okay. Thank you for asking it. Um, so this was a, it's a really hard thing to struggle, um, or something I struggled with that a lot of people struggle with when learning the nurtured heart approach. Um, I, I can go back to that slide. Let me take a second for the three stands, right? Um, and what we can do is we teach something in nurtured heart approach called the reset. And it really, um, what it is, is it's really giving the child an opportunity to recognize that what they just did was, you know, not in line with um, the rules, the boundaries that were set um, as part of stand three. Um, and so refusing to give your time, your energy and relationship to negative behavior, it's not so much that you are not acknowledging it, right? You are acknowledging it and then you're asking that child to reset. And you know, my two-year-old daughter learned to reset. Um, and so when they do reset, they kind of start over and the first sign um, or movement towards some positive behavior um, that you notice that's when you go in with stand two, which is absolutely yes. And you relentlessly energize and give the child as much, if not more of your, your time, your attention, um, your energy to really strengthen that connection in their brain that what they just did was where they are going to, where you're going to show up for them, right? So maybe they do something wrong they break a rule um, and you set the absolutely clear boundary that this is the rule. This is what happens when you break a rule. A toe on the line is a toe on the line. So no warnings that we learn that warnings are not compassionate. Um, they actually encourage uh, some children to amp it up uh, to see how far they can take it. So you really have to practice all three of these stands together. Um, and not accidentally fostering or energizing negative behavior and rewarding those problems um, by responding really animated and giving giving your attention to to that um, behavior. Um, and so really searching for success. Um, so like, you know, I think of like bedtime routine, right? Most parents can tell you about the bedtime routine and just how that can be a real struggle. Um, and it you really have to sort of make these like um, a big celebration, a big deal out of like, I just saw you moving toward your toothbrush right now. That is awesome. That shows me that you really are listening to me and you kind of stop, right? 
But when we're dealing with um, vulnerable populations, you know, when we're dealing in, in trauma informed ways, this is a really hard one. You have to start really small um, because that child is, is not really going to want to receive praise. Um, there is a, an, an element of trust that is not uh, um, quite established um, right yet. Like if you start, if you want to start energizing them in this way, they're going to want to maybe test the limits a little bit. So you have to start really, really small um, a lot of times with these kiddos. I hope that answers the question. Did I answer all parts of the question, Taylor? You did. Thank you. Yeah, and I thank you. I want to just share really quick, like one way to uh, practice nurtured heart, which is a lot of fun. Um, and typically, I like to do a breakout um, with this, but it's called the Sarah technique, um, which is part of the nurtured heart approach. Um, and I just want to share, like, it doesn't encompass the entire nurtured heart approach. It's just one experiential tool that's used um, to really ignite inner wealth, to um, support you know, um, sharing moments of greatness with the children or anybody in your life. Um, but really, it, it allows for an opportunity to um, to get in touch with our hearts, to share our thoughts and emotions, um, and share truths about the moment. Um, and you'll notice, you know, real perceptual shifts of an energy um, toward positive behaviors when you use these. And so, like this Sarah technique, you could do this actually very quickly in the hallway. It probably doesn't seem like it, right? Um, but once you practice it um, and and you can implement this technique, um, it, it's really transformative um, in really small doses. And then obviously in more with more time and opportunity for connection um, to really build those relationships and, and shift towards positive behaviors. Perfect. Thanks, Heidi. And we do have one more question. Um, I know we're a little bit over time, um, but Karen also asked, um, with many of the community programs, a family has had, a family often has to be in dire need before they step in. So she's wondering how to provide assistance before a family gets to the point of dire need. Yeah. Could you share a little bit more about, or give me an example? I'm looking to see if Karen's still on here and if we could maybe get her. Well, I, you know, in the meantime, I think like one of the things that um, is really helpful is relying on the, on the community partners, right? Um, and so really reaching out to schools um, places where, you know, teachers um, are so in tune with their students, they will, you know, in preschools, um, so starting very young and Head Start programs, um, are really um, trained and um, uh, perceptive of noticing changes. Children trust them um, and will share things with them often, right? Um, and so I would say um, definitely probably, you know, one way to do that would be to connect with the schools um, and establishing a, a referral system um, that way. Wonderful. Thank you, Heidi. And we just wanted to say thank you again for coming, agreeing to present to us and sharing all of your expertise and um, just some examples of all the amazing work that you do with both Charm and Camp Druzy as well. Um, for anybody still on, um, it's very much appreciated if you are able to um, fill out our evaluations form. Some of my team members have um, put that in the chat, um, but we will be sending an email out with a um, recording of the presentation and then also the evaluation link if you need to um, uh, fill that out at another time. So I'm going to drop my email in the chat here as well if you have any questions or need um, any proof of attendance today you can reach out to me as well and I can send you a certificate of completion. So 
Thank you all for being here with us today. And thanks again to Heidi and the Ultra team for um, bringing this to us today. So hope thank you, you all thank have you a great for the day. opportunity.